you never know what's going to happen, but you know, I'm all about you know scoring goals and, and trying to make assists. So, and break Wayne Rooney's record. Hopefully, <laughs> I've actually spoke to to Azra about it, and you know, he, you're he coming wants, for him. No, he wants me to do it. He, he doesn't. Me. They always say that strikers. <laughs> When I look back, it's just like six or seven months wasted. I wish I would have spoke to someone before the operation. Yeah. Do you know what was the saddest thing? Just before the pandemic, I bumped into an old school friend and he was homeless. <laughs> no, oh, oh, <laughs> that sums up my career. Did it take away any of your love for playing for England? We've come to Portugal to see Manchester United and England's Marcus Rashford to talk to him about his career, the ups, the downs, his family, the charitable work and the work that he did during the pandemic. And he's taking part in a pre-pre-season, yeah, the pre-season before the pre-season. So we're here at the campus in Portugal. Just tell us a little bit about what you do in this sort of like pre-pre-season period. Yeah, f f like for me, it's just about getting back up to speed, you know, before I want to go back into pre-season. Um, a lot of it is obviously to do with the physical aspects, but also just when I go back into pre-season, I enjoy everyone like being back together again because we've been away from each other for yeah. a while. I don't want to go back into pre-season and be dying every day. <laughs> so, like um, I used to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good to get... I, I usually do it every year, to be fair. Just get back into shape. Have you done it every year? Because last year, I remember sort of there being a big thing about you doing this sort of, like, 10-day camp. And yeah. after you came back last year and you looked unbelievable. You so you're strong, you're fit, you look like you'd sort of gained yeah. another yard. What, what have you done in this last sort of 12 months that sort of made that sort of difference physically? I think last year I had a bit more time off, so I could do a double the training camp really, so I've done probably two weeks in total. Yeah. Um, 10 days of ball work and running and gym, but four days before of just getting back up to speed, so I really had the time to just do everything that I needed to tick off and I felt really well-rounded going into pre-season so like I said I wanted to be in that position this season as well so um yeah it's important for me to come out and get the work in. Do you not just feel like you mean you play that many games you know the internationals the world cup obviously last Christmas all the United games United were in every competition to the end yeah. this season do you not feel like just saying right actually I just need that break? Yeah that's probably I've done a slightly shorter camp this this time I've only done um eight days. Eight uh, days of continuous training or? yeah yeah. What's Eric Ten Hag's pre-season like last season compared to, say, the, the managers that you've had previously? Eric's is one of the toughest, I'd say. What, physically, running-wise, or...? Running-wise, yeah, but also just we do a lot of, like, passing drills and it's a lot of mental concentration and when you're tired, you know, it's, it's difficult to concentrate, you know, for long periods of time when you're, when you're already physically tired. Just like running with the, obviously, during the actual ball? Yeah, in be, we usually do it in work. between, so we'll do a technical, I don't know, 20, 30 minute session and then we'll go into maybe eight or ten blocks of box to boxes or like shorter intensity runs and then we'll go back into technical yeah so it's not actually a tough session but when you do it in the heat of yeah. the places that we train and it's it's proper challenging and um, but no I, I enjoyed it like I said I, I turned up to pieces in, in good shape so I was just enjoying you know the new coach and getting used to him. When I was back at United, it started to be introduced that players would have their own individual programmes and they'd have sometimes their own individual coaches. Have you got a team around you that sort of work with you separately from also the club's coaching staff as well? Yeah, 100%. Um, but I've had that from a really young age. Really. Once I signed my first professional contract, I wanted to... Was it 17 or 16? Yeah, 17. But I didn't... You're still in college. You don't really need the money that they're giving you. So I thought I had a conversation with my brother and I think it's important to invest it in yourself and you know, do what you can do to better yourself. So I got myself a psychologist and a, a strength and conditioning coach from 17 and just stayed with them throughout, really. Are they still with you now, just to have that team yeah. around you, that tight team? Yeah, so because I don't like to chop and change. Um, like, I feel like they know me from when I was younger and, you know, before everything happened with United, like the success and stuff like that, they, they know me from before that, so yeah. I feel comfortable around them. It, it blows my mind that because I used to think like tennis player or a golfer or like an individual athlete they would have their team yeah. around them. Then, if you're in a team sport, 
you'd all do the collective together and I you'd all work some, together. I think sometimes it gets neglected when you're in a team sport, but you have to remember in a team sport, if every individ individual's at the top of the game or the best that they can be, yeah. as a team, you're going to be better. So it's obviously important to do stuff as a team because it's you need to win yeah. together and, and fight for each other. But at the same time, you, especially in the forward positions, I feel like you have to be able to bring something different to to the table. Um, so yeah, I've always just had that team around me and I feel like it's been beneficial to me, so I probably won't change. I came out of football 12, 12 years ago as a player, but five, six years ago as a coach. It feels to yeah. me like it's gone to another level. The sort of this type of camp, you know, there's not just you here, there's other players as well. Yeah. Just practicing and, and literally perfecting everything rather than just taking your rest. Yeah, I just think that the, the level's so high in the league if, if I don't do these things, maybe you start the season and you don't feel like you're up to, up to scratch and, you know, I, d I don't, I don't want to be in that position. I don't think it's a nice position to be in. Um, you know, you've probably played in games yourself where the other team's been that much better than you and you just yeah. a step behind everything. Yeah. What, what would you say is the one thing that you'd like to add to your sort of, you know, the physicality? Because you look absolutely spot on. You've got no body fat on you. Lightning quick, <laughs> you're strong. You know, what is it just maintaining what you've got? Is there something that you think you'd like to add to your game that would make you a lot better? I think there's always elements. I think it's always important to work on your strengths. I never stop working on my strengths. And you know, you want to get your weaknesses as, as good as they can get, but you know, your weaknesses are more often than not always going to be a little bit behind your, your strengths. So mine's left foot, head in. I always want to work on them. And your, head's like getting that, your head's getting better though, eh? Yeah, but I still feel like I should score more because I out-jump most people. <laughs> so I, f I feel like if I'm in the position, in the, in the right areas, in the box, then I should be getting you know, seven, seven to ten headers a season. So I still feel like I can do that and I'll be pushing to do that next season. And what about the left foot in terms of that side of things? You have a finishing coach. Do you work on that side of it a lot? Yeah, for me, with my left foot, it's just about confidence, you know? Like, I feel like when I'm confident, I score with it. Because you're on that left side a lot, aren't you, going down that yeah, left channel? Yeah. When I'm not confident, it just never goes right with my left foot. Yeah. When you're not confident in terms of your overall game, yeah. or just, yeah. Yeah. But if I'm feeling confident and I'm feeling, you know, strong and fit and healthy, I, f I feel like if I get an opportunity on my left, I've got a good chance of, of scoring as long as, like I said, as long as I'm in the right areas. Yeah. So a lot of it is about just getting into the right areas because my, my striker coach, he was a forward. So he, yeah. he always gives me information on <laughs> getting in across the front post or, you know, on the shoulder of defenders and stuff like that. But it's good for me to know that because even when I'm wide, it helps me understand what my forward would be thinking yeah. and where I need to deliver the ball or try and you know, get assists from that aspect. And if I am making the box, I know where I need to be, so. How much do you analyse your game after, let's say a game's finished on a Saturday, how much do you analyse sort of your performance after that game, or do you move on to the next, because the next one's coming so quickly? Yeah, I think when, when you've got three games a week, I analyse it, but maybe not as much. Yeah. Um, probably the day after a game, if I've got a week between, I'll recover the day after a game and then do it on the, the Monday. The Monday, or, yeah. yeah. But I think it's it's important because a lot of my game is just being in the right positions at the right time. Yeah. I think sometimes wingers neglect it now. But for, for me, it's... Because I can always see the forward. The forward can't see me, so I have to go yeah. off his movements. But at the same time, which, whichever defender's mark me, I have to make it a tough day for him and, you know, try and get blindside of him, make sure he can't, can't see me. When he gets square, try and get across him in them moments. But because I've been, you know, working on it for so long, it is becoming like second nature now, and yeah. I find myself looking for them things without really telling myself to do it. So that's good. But you know, you have to keep working on it to to keep improving. Marcus, I'm going to get absolutely <laughs> shamed here. I'm going to have a game of head tennis. First to five. Yeah. <laughs> this could absolutely destroy your career if I beat you. Here. You realise that, don't you? <laughs> Here we go. Oh, here oh, you go, my serve. It's short, it's short. Is that 1 0? <laughs> <laughs> Don't control it. And get back there. <laughs> hey! You better shape up. Oh, it's out. Getting carried away, 2 1. Oh, no. Oh, it was never going to work that. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, how bad's that? 
Yes. Oh! Oh! oh. <laughs> Free all. <laughs> Get over there. Ah! Oh, he flipped it. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Three. I'm not doing bad, but I think he's been kind to me. Oh, fuck. <laughs> he broke my ankle twice. Oh, oh! Oh, it's out. Pause. <laughs> That's point. No, oh. oh, no way he's no. done that. No, so he must be like, oh, no. Oh, no. That sums up my career. Back it was better that you won. <laughs> well done. <sighs> <laughs> we planned for four or five scenarios before everything started. They're tough, aren't they? Like yeah, you think about how tough she must have been. She's the toughest out of all of us. <laughs> So, Marcus, we're just on the way down to the beach, but on the way, I just thought I'd ask you a little bit about your early years and yeah. um, growing up in Manchester, and particularly playing for Fletcher Moss, which is a famous yeah. young local club. How, how was that for you? I enjoyed it. I felt like it was the... Like, my, bro, my both my brothers played for Fletcher Moss, so that was, like, the local team to go to, and plus, it had a good resume of people moving on to academies, which, which you know, was the ultimate aim. I mean, but, yeah. Like at home, it was the thing was to have fun. We had discipline, obviously, because my mum was a single parent. So when she went out, it was up to my brother and, and like my older sister to like manage the household. So there was a high amount of discipline, but it was always fun. Like I enjoyed my, my upbringing. Talk to me about your mum. I mean, she must be a special person. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I, I only realised how tough it was for her when I moved out the house and I realised how, like when I went into digs, I realised how life was on, it was only 20 minutes away. Yeah. But how life was and like over there, it was completely different to what I was used to and it actually made me feel a bit uncomfortable at first. In what way? Just like where I come from is noise all the time. So after a certain amount of time, like you get used to sleeping when there's noise and then, yeah. I remember the first night I couldn't sleep. Noises in what, like cars or just people everything? People shouting, or? police, people. Like, I live facing shops as well, so right. There was one takeaway shop that didn't close till four or five in the morning. So yeah, there was always some type of noise. And when I moved to to Sale, there was just no. It was just silent. We could just hear the wind. That was it, and it, I couldn't sleep like yeah. the first couple of nights. That, but after like the first. Maybe three weeks, four weeks, I started to settle down and I was lucky really because the family that we, I got put with um, and great people and you know I still stay in contact with them now and yeah they're definitely a, a huge part of my, my upbringing because I feel like that transition was difficult for some, some people in my age group uh, when they had to leave home so you know I, I got lucky really. There's a, there's a quote I read of your mum's where she said there were times where she used to be able to put only food on the table for yourselves and actually not have any herself. I mean, that's... Yeah, but you just, at the time, you'd never know because she'd always just have a smile Get on, on with it. it. Yeah. They're tough, aren't they? Like, yeah, you think about how tough she must have been. She's the toughest out of all of us. <laughs> she is, she still is now. Like, nothing will, nothing can break her. And your brothers obviously work with you, don't they? Your yeah. mum works. Just tell us a little bit about what they do for you now in terms of your professional life away yeah. from football. Uh, obviously, my brothers, both my brothers are my agents, and my mum. I'm trying to get her to just relax a little bit. I want her to enjoy herself, but she's she's a workaholic. Um, so in the beginning, she was doing like some of my commercial stuff with with Nike alongside my brothers. But now, at the minute, we've managed to wind her down a little <laughs> bit. She's um she's in control of like fan mail, and she enjoys doing it though. But she how much fan mail do you get a week? Oh, uh, her house is piling up. <laughs> she doesn't miss one though. No, no, she don't. Replies miss to every single one. Yeah, which yeah. is good. Like I, I enjoy doing it, but after a long day of trading, you should run around something else with five hundred shirts to sign. It's not good <laughs> to pretend like I'm sleeping. <laughs> tomorrow, mum. Tomorrow. <laughs> Thinking about you growing up and your mum really fighting hard to have to put food on people's table. Did that inform what happened later in your life, where obviously you just did the most amazing thing during the pandemic with the free school meals? Do you know what I think? We've always, even though we were struggling ourselves, we've always give back 
I remember a couple of times on New Year's at the cliff, we used to get the bus into town. So we used to pass the road to homeless people and my mum literally would give me the last couple of quid in a purse to give to a homeless person even back then. So I've, I feel like it's everyone in, like my mum does her own things, my sisters do their own things, my brothers do their own things. And then we came together and made this idea. Um, and yeah, it's, it's something that we all, it's, it's important to all of us and it's it's close to home, you know. I, I, do you know what was the saddest thing? Just before the pandemic, I bumped into an old school friend and he was homeless. And he just, I remember him at school and he, he was one of the ones where his, his parents was in better position than the yours. Yeah, than, than most of us, like. Yeah. And then to see him there, like it, it was, it was a bit of a shocking moment, like, like it pushed me back a little bit and I just felt like definitely we were gonna try and do something to, you know, not change just his life, but everyone's lives that are in difficult situations. And like, it's a long, it's a long process. We're still early on in the, in the process, but I'm just pleased that it's up and running now because it, step by step, it takes more care of itself and the public have shown that they care. And I feel like more, more people have made a difference now and made, made a change to, to people's lives. Do you recognize how big and important it was that what you did. I mean, you overturned government policy. It was unbelievable, the impact you had. I mean, I've got a university which has got about seven or 800 students. And if I asked them on a vote, who would their most popular person would be in Greater Manchester, they'd say you 100%. I just know that for a fact. Do you have any yeah, idea I, of what you achieved? You uh, overturned government policy. Yeah, that's the thing that I didn't really concentrate on, like the government U-turn. That wasn't at the forefront of my mind. Like I knew that we might have had to do that from when Boris made the decision to go public with what he said after we spoke to him. I knew that was the next thing that we had to change, but the, it actually pushed me towards the public a bit more and we needed them as, as support and they was learning more about the topic as I was learning about the topic as well because the numbers are more crazy than what you, what you could ever imagine and especially in, in Greater Manchester, so it was, more about helping the, the individuals that needed the help than it was ever about. I, I wish that the U-turn never had to actually happen. Um, I wish we just managed to get it done straight away because at the end of the day, we lost a little bit of time, which, you know, time is is important and a lot of things can happen in a short space of time. Well, when I, I always think about football players and think of, um, they get criticised when they don't plan for the end of their career but you have definitely see that you got need to have your head screwed on and you're smart. Where's that come from, that sort of business sort of like mentality that you have? I think it started with my mum. My mum's like very business minded and she always has been. She just hasn't been in the position to have the opportunities yeah. to, you know, do what she really wanted to do. But she's always had that mindset and then, you know, it just gets passed down. Like my, my both my brothers are, are the same and my sisters when they want to be are the same as well. Yeah. I find that quite sad because your mum obviously was struggling to put food on your table but she'd just been given a chance and someone had invested in her. Yeah. Obviously she could have, you know Yeah, what I mean? she definitely could have. Like my mum started doing properties when I was 18 and she'd done it all. She, I didn't... Well, well managed all your property yeah, purchases and everything. She still does, most of them. But like sh she just always knew. She judged her at the end of each month how she's doing. <laughs> hey mum, no, you could do a bit better with this. She'll still shower at me if I got <laughs> I played with David Beckham and he was just, he would say, you know, I'm a football player, yeah, of course I'm a football player, but I'm also someone who wants to do more than just play football. He strikes me that you're a little bit like that as well. You're a lot like that, in fact. Was there a point whereby you ever felt overwhelmed by everything that was happening and you thought, oh, this is getting so big, I just need to sort of pull back a little bit here? Um, not really, because we, we planned for, you know, four or five scenarios before everything started because obviously we don't know what's going to happen, so we just thought, worst case scenario, we, we plan for, you know, five or six different scenarios that could play out. So it was just about executing yeah. whichever one out of the six that we had to choose from. Um, so yeah, most of the well, work was- you say six, sorry, what are you, you referring to six? Just seven? six scenarios, like whether, like the U-turns one example, we didn't know that that was yeah. going to happen, but we had to prepare in case it did happen. And then when it did happen, we didn't have to, panic and oh let's yeah. do this for three or four months and so you felt relaxed then did you a little bit yeah it was it was that moth you don't like moths do it <laughs> <laughs> it was um ah. <laughs> no but it, i felt like it was important to to do that because i didn't want it to obviously when i started the planning i was, I was yeah. seven months injured i was when i actually started i was three months shut down so i couldn't do anything for three months um 
So I just thought, now's the time to start. I've got the time and willingness to do it, so why not? So that's when we started it. And then I felt like it was a clever thing to do to get a team behind us yeah. to, that can manage day to day and make sure we have five or, diff, five or six different answers for whatever might come up. And, you know, luckily we had prepared for, for the one that did come up. And yeah, I'm thankful for that. And are you the sort of person who knows exactly what it is you're going to do when you retire from football already? Or is it a case um, of you thinking, no, I'll just sort of cross that bridge when I come to it? No, I definitely have options, but and I've, still, I've still got years left. I don't need to. You've got a long, think, you've yeah. got a long time left. I hope, hopefully, I can play until you know, 36, 37. Do you think like a coach, or do you think like someone who might go into business? No, or? no I won't do coaching straight away. No, I feel like football's so like people don't understand how mentally you know challenging it is it's not always about the physicality but mentally day to day just the concentration that you have to put in it, it can be draining so i feel like when i do retire i want to go cool away from yeah, it a little for, bit yeah for a little bit but coaching is definitely a, an option because I, I feel like i've the, the love for the game's never going to go away so mm. i'll still you know enjoy playing football and being involved in, in the sport so it's definitely an option but yeah i mean I'm, it's interesting to i don't want to like plan it all out really I just want to have the options and then when we get there see, just see yeah see how it plays out how often would you speak to psychology what sort of work would you do with you around moments like that when I look back it's just like six or seven months wasted I wish I would have spoke to someone before the operation yeah. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode. This is just a quick thank you to Skybet, our partners, for making this show happen. It's something I've wanted to do for a long, long time. Please subscribe, there's loads more episodes coming up and I hope you're enjoying it. So this section is called Failure is a Bruise, not a Tattoo. So it's when I went to Valencia and didn't do very well. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> in fact it was shambolic. What was your low point, that moment where you just feel like it hasn't been as bad as this and you've had to sort of dig in? Probably the lowest point was the post shoulder operation. I'd never had any serious injuries before, like wearing required surgery or anything like that. It was tough mentally because I, I, I knew physically I was better, but yeah. I didn't have confidence in it. So we had to go into challenges yeah, and stuff. And... and I felt like I was backing away. And obviously, because I play on the left side, I roll a lot inside. Yeah. So I have to use that arm quite often and quite a lot. And yeah, I just didn't have the confidence within it. But how did that come back? Just just time and just working just on it? Just time. It, took, it probably took until, you know, like the winter break in February, I think it was. We went to Dubai. Yeah. And then it, it felt a bit, I felt a bit more confident after that. Yeah. But it did take like, six or seven months for me to feel like myself yeah. again. And then I, when I look back, it's just like six or seven months wasted. I wish I would have spoke to someone uh, before the operation. Yeah. And he would have said, listen, you're going to feel this after, you're going to feel like this. Yeah. You, this could happen. But I didn't really, I just, I had to just get on with it because I, I didn't want to miss that much of the season. So I actually came, he recovered quite quickly. But just when the game, when I started playing, yeah, you just didn't, didn't feel right. Yeah, I didn't feel Did 100%. You, you said before as part of your team you've got a psychologist. Yeah. How often would you speak to psychologists and what sort of stuff would you, what sort of work would you do with you around moments like that? Yeah, sometimes it's not genuinely about the football. It's just about dealing with setbacks and we actually did some good work, but you can do good work yeah. off the pitch, but when you get on there... You, you still you, feel that more. Yeah, sometimes you just... Something doesn't feel right. Do you feel like you're at that point in your life now, 25, where you've had that sort of, you've come in, you've had that huge sort of a lot of excitement, then you have yeah. that little bit of a dip, and then last season you were just flying. Do you feel like you've come through it and that now everything else in front of you feels like, you know, you are going to be a little more unbreakable almost in terms of, because you've seen it all before? Yeah, 100%. I, f I just feel like I've experienced the, the biggest games and, you know, I've been in the, the most high pressure situations and, you know, I always think to myself, like, how can I help other players, like, certain players have, have helped me. And I feel like now I'm actually in the, the right position and, and stuff to genuinely help them and, you know, help, help them in the beginning of their careers and you know, try and set them off in the right direction the same way people like Waza, Karaz, Juan, set, set me off in, in the right direction. I was thinking last season watching you, it almost felt like, obviously, you know, you've got a lot of excellent players at United, but when you 
Casemiro and Bruno Fernandes weren't playing as a three. It was mm. a big problem that you were almost becoming the leaders in the team. I could put Lissandro Martins in that probably bracket mm. as well. Do you, do you feel like that now, like you've stepped up into that leadership pack? Like you're one of those players at the club that you know you, everyone looks up to and if you're not playing, it's like, oh, we're missing him today. Yeah, I think I think that does happen, but it's it's a blow when you when you lose any player earlier in the squad because the squad is the strength. It's not just the 11 that's on the pitch. Yeah. And, Remember a couple of players got injured in, against Reading in, uh, in a cup game, and it's just yeah. it, it puts everyone down a little bit because you know Donny was out for a long time after that, Christian was out for a little bit, and yeah. the game was already won when these injuries yeah. happen. And it's just like it does when you come in the next day to training and you see him on the treatment bed, and you know you know how down they are. It's it's disheartening, and so it's not just the the players that you know are playing every week. It's the squad, really, and we have to try and keep that. I think Eric really concentrated on that when he came in, um, making everyone together as one. You know, it's impossible for everyone to play every game, but I think as a player, you have to accept and support when, you, when you're not playing. And when you are playing, you have to, you know, give everything and try and do what you can to, to help the team win the game. In the league, there was a period where we weren't defending as well and we stopped scoring as many goals as we were scoring. There was a moment, wasn't there, where he sort of like left you out. Did you, did you agree with him on that point? So let's talk about Manchester United and I think back to my start of my career and how fortunate I was to come into a stable environment where there was one manager, they just won the Premier League title, there were brilliant senior players who obviously had success. And I think of where you came into, you know, you've had absolutely the opposite of that. You've had five managers, you've had different styles of play, a lot's been asked of you. How has that been? How hard has that been? Uh, it's been a little bit tough, but I, honestly, I've, I've enjoyed working under the, the different managers because I feel like I've been able to take a little bit from, from each manager and it's, it's helped me mature, especially in the early stages, helped me mature quickly and helped my game develop a little bit more. So I think there's definitely stuff that I've taken from, from each, each manager that's helped shape my game to, to where it is now. And hopefully, you know, we do get that stability now and, and we can go into definitely challenge and hopefully win, win the biggest trophies. And then just talked about Eric Ten Hag. Obviously, you've enjoyed last season. You had an absolutely incredible season, scoring all those goals. What was the biggest difference? What changed when he came in? Because he certainly had some big decisions to deal with as well along the way, and he was tough, wasn't he, with them? No, 100%. Um, but when, just when he came in, I didn't hear him speak about getting in the top four once. He just wanted to win trophies. And, you know, if, if you've got that mentality, I've always been around people that have yeah. that mentality. So. so he was telling you we're going to win trophies at this club? Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what, what we're playing in, whether it's Europa League or Premier League, any, any of the cup trophies. He wanted to try and win everything. And listen, the players, we give it everything we could. We let ourselves down definitely in, in the Europa League. And I feel like in the league, there was a period where we weren't defending as well and we stopped scoring as many goals as we were scoring. So. That's something that I'll definitely want to correct for. Yeah, those big games, there's some big defeats, weren't there, in the sort of three or four games? Yeah, so like, almost 100%, like... but we'd always bounce back from them. Listen, it's, it's, it feels, there's no, there's no lower point when you go to rival teams and concede four, five, six goals. There's nothing worse than that. You have to try and find the positives in the game after. We always had a good performance and won. How did you recover? Because you always did seem to recover from those defeats. When uh, what, was it, what was his words or what did you all do we, after those we'd, games? We'd still do the... Game analysis. You go back and watch it again, maybe. Even after like a seven 0 at Anfield, you go maybe and watch not, it. Maybe not watch it, but he'd he'd watch it definitely, and he'd dissect it to us in maybe a team meeting. Team team. Yeah, because sometimes as players, you definitely don't want to watch it. But I feel like his his understanding of, of players is very high, and there's nothing worse. And I definitely don't want to watch it. I don't want to watch any games back because yeah. what's the point? There's nothing you can take from him. But the next game, it's important to clear your head because yeah. you can't let that dwell because we had some big fixtures especially after Liverpool game we had Sociedad at, at home I think it was and you know we had a really good form so I think we won 4-1 but yeah it's it's not easy to to recover but he, he'd always throughout the, whatever time we had after after a bad result he'd give us confidence again and you know remind us sometimes that listen you are you wouldn't be here if you aren't good players and I'm not one to need that all the time but there is times after games like that 
you know, just a reminder, like, it's the next game, you're yeah. going to you're gonna do it. And he always gave us that full confidence and support. But like I said, in the end, we, we fell uh, short in the league. I was disappointed with how we finished the, the league because I felt like we could have, you know, put a bit more more pressure on you know, Arsenal and, and sit in. In the end, it was, you know, 15 points, 20 points gap. So it's a little bit disappointing. And, but yeah, we, you know, we managed to get a... A trophy over the line, which is always important, not only for the players but for the the fans. I mean, the culture of, of Man United it's, it's always been about winning trophies, and it's good to get back to that because it's been a few years since we have. He quite obviously loves you. I mean, you've played for him nearly every game this season, but there was a moment, wasn't there, where he sort of like left you out? Did you, did you agree with him on that point? Was that no, hundred percent. I, I learned from pre-season. Like a couple of the the lads was a couple of minutes late in, in pre-season and. It was important for him to implement them rules there and then. Because that's unusual for you. You would never be late, would you, in any, you know, in any situation? No, listen, I wasn't even that much late. But <laughs> was I he was, being harsh? <laughs> no, I don't think he was being harsh because late it's late at the yeah. end of the day, but it was probably about 45 seconds and a minute late. But I already knew what was going to happen because of the rules that he implemented in pre-season, so yeah. I'm not going to sit and argue about it because we've got a, we've got a game to try and win and moves away for, for us in the last couple of years. It's not been an easy place to go, so... It's, there's a time and a place when to speak to him about it, but if we if we go on and win the game, then nobody nobody cares. You came back from the World Cup, and it was it was glo it was a glorious watch seeing you play as well as you did. I think there's only Erling Haaland scored more goals after the World yeah. Cup. What what changed after that World Cup? Because you just looked absolutely unstoppable. You really want to play for England, don't you? Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's a it's a huge part of of my career, and I feel like the team's. I'm very strong and like we, we've got a good chance of winning stuff and I'm you know obviously desperate to be a, be a part of it but when I come back from the World Cup I, I feel like I'm, there is a mentality change and I, I felt like I was you know up there with, with some of the, the best players in the world at that time. You sit here today having scored 30 goals last season and it's your best ever season do you feel like that's it now you that's it you know you, you've hit that mark and you feel like yeah there's no time to I, I wouldn't I think before that I'd always said like let's get to, to twenty. I think twenty for a for a wing is a good bench trap. But you know, this season I've I've hit thirty so we have to try and try and push it now and, and go and build in the end. But yeah, I, I feel like I can definitely do it. I think towards the end of the season I was struggling with a few, you know, injuries and I probably weren't quite quite yeah. high at it. And that's when the goals started to, to you know dry up a little bit. But if I can get that, that side of it, keep keep that under and the, and the taps and you know I feel like I can definitely go go and you know, get 35 or, or 40. Roy brought you into the England team back in 2016 which yeah. is seven years ago it's interesting because going back to my career and I think of Wayne Rooney had a hard time with England at times David Beckham had a hard time with England my brother had a hard time with England mm. Manchester United players do sometimes suffer quite a bit with sort of criticism yeah. um, and you obviously got that you know you were racially abused after the yeah. Euro 2020 did it take away any of your love for playing for England? Just the fact that obviously you just, you know, it was just a football action. It was something that happens obviously time and time again. Yeah. I think maybe, maybe a little bit, but not for a, it wasn't for a long period of time. I mentioned like with my shoulders, a little bit down for a couple of months. And yeah. that's probably when it was playing on my mind a little bit, but I'm not one to dwell on situations. I just want to be positive about it and move forward. Cause yeah. like I said to you before, I feel like I have 100% faith in, in the England set off. And, I feel like if we get little things right, we can compete with the, the best teams in the world, as we've already shown, but there's still another step for us to yeah. take, and I, I do believe that we can take it. I feel like the squad, everyone's at good ages. We've got a big opportunity that I don't want to I don't want to throw it away because of what's happened yeah. in, in the past. How important is it for you at the end of this season that you're starting for England in a major tournament? Yeah, massively. I feel like, you know, there's been times in between major tournaments where I've, I've started for, you know, 18 months. When it comes to the tournament, and then I'm not, been out. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not starting. Oh, I mean, like in and out the team. So it's it's definitely important for for me as a player to try and you know get that spot yeah. nailed down and try and bring my qualities to the team because I feel like it's. We're, listen, we've got many good players, and there's a there's a time for every player. But I'm, I've still not had my you know proper opportunity in major tournaments yet. And it's clear your future long term is going to be at Manchester United, you know, what you've spoken to me about today. How excited are you about that? And will we see you lift that wanna see you lift that Premier League trophy soon? I hope so. That's that's been my dream ever since I was a kid, you know. I've I watched, you know, your guys in, in your team win it so many times. 
it almost became natural for us to, to see us win it. We, we forgot about the hard work that he's put into every game and we almost expected expected just to, to be lift here in trophy come the end of the season and it'll be unbelievable for, for me to get my hands on, on that trophy with United. So, you know, hopefully we, we manage to do that. And break Wayne Rooney's record? Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. You're not far away, you're halfway there and you've played a mountain of games already, haven't you? Yeah. You never know what's going to happen, but you know I'm all about you know scoring goals and, and trying to make assists. So you know there's definitely a chance that, that it can happen. And I've actually spoke to to Wazza about it. And you know he, he coming wants, for him. No, he wants me to do it. He, he doesn't. Me. They always say that strikers. <laughs> but you is a bit different. He is a bit different. Yeah, he said it would be good for me to do because you know I've grew up at the club and yeah. and stuff like that. But you know I'm I'm hopefully I get the opportunity to to try and make that happen. But all the talk, I mean, you're talking about staying at the club, you're talking about breaking the record. But was there a point a couple of years ago where you had that little doubt that you thought, do I believe in this anymore? Is there a moment where I might just have to go and sort of maybe play elsewhere? I thought that might have happened. Obviously, I'd not asked you at the time, and I'm yeah. only speaking to you now for the first time about it. No, I feel, I feel like all players probably go through that stage, whether they've been at their Boyhood Club for, you know, 10 years or 12 years, I think. Yeah. You know, when you think about it deeply, you, there's nothing better than winning at, at Man United, so I feel like at the age I'm at, I've still got a big opportunity to, to try and do that. And the timing just, I feel like we're, we're closer than what we think, but we still need to take them extra steps. And at the minute we've got a, we've got a manager that's fully dedicated to just winning at all costs. And he wants us to be as best as we can be individually, yeah. as best as we can be as a team. And at the end of the day, he wants us to win trophies. And there's been some games where, Coming fuming at half time because we're not playing well. But he's, he, he just says, listen, like, relax. He knows we're not playing well, but we're still in the game and we're going to yeah. fight to win the game. It doesn't matter if we're in 1 0 or 3 0 in the second half. But if we get that one goal, just be ready for that one chance. And it's like a refocus. Um, so it's, it's important that, you know, I keep that in mind to the point where he doesn't have to keep reminding me. You know, it just happens naturally. Do you feel like he's got something different, Eric Ten Hag, than? the previous four managers that you've worked under, that you can get that, make that final step and get over the line and win a Premier League title? You know, I feel like he has. The only time's gonna, gonna tell, but I feel like he's got the players 100%. So we're gonna give 100% for, for him, for the badge and for the fans. So we should always, you know, give 110% in, in every game, no matter which opponent you're playing against, and in that when you're the one that's you know trying to give 100% all the time. Brilliant, Marcus. Yeah. Great to speak to you today. Thank, Thank you so you. much, and good Appreciate luck with the season. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.